Jim. I, I don't know if we need the mic, but we got it. Uh, my name's Jay, uh, along with Claire, I help organize the bookie readings. And today we have Steve Luttrell featured, and Lee Wilkinson's going to provide music. He's been playing since at least his high school days to audiences. 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> that's nothing. Yeah, yeah I know, right? Is that all? Look around. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say. Read the audience. <laughs> and I uh, just wanted to mention that next month, second Saturday of the month, I think that's the 9th. Yes. Um, same time, same place. We'll have Megan Br Megan Grumbling and Michelle Menting reading. I hope some of you can make it for that. And we're going to have a reading every month, weather permitting, including the winter. Uh, in the winter, we're going to have a lot of open mics. But we'll have a reading every month. We think we have a really good uh, slate of poets for you this year. So. Spread the word if, if you can. And uh, I'm going to let Lee play, and then Claire will introduce Steve. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is Lee Wilkinson. I'm the adult services librarian here. So you can just ignore if I, have, if I use a lot of contractions or incorrect language in my music. It's art. So. <laughs> And there was 
Uh, this is my sign. Uh, it's my Instagram handle. Man of leisure. <laughs> but leisure is spelled with like my, it has my name in it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for supplying that. Very pretty, very pretty. Okay, I'm going to do uh, one more tune and then we can get on with the program. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Lee. Yes. So when, Lil, when Lee first got hired here, I thought, Lee Wilkinson, where have I heard this name? Then I remembered he was in my, um, I was an advisor for a pep band in high school. Do you remember that? A long time ago. And I didn't know he could do this. <laughs> here he is. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we have what I consider, can you hear me without this? Do I no. need to? you okay? Um, I, we have what I consider a, a, a poet to me that was kind of a mystery because I had always heard the name Steve. Is it Latrell or Latrell? Because uh, I always say Latrell. He says Latrell. So, <laughs> Latrell or Latrell? It, it's originally Latrell and Latrell. <laughs> it was originally Yates, and then they changed the name. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So his, his mother started using Latrell. Latrell. Okay, well. So it's really Latrell. So we're going to do both, Latrell and Latrell. <laughs> so um, let's see. Steve is from the Portland area. He was Portland's Poet Laureate. Uh, when was that, Steve? What years? Uh, 2009. 2009. 2011, I think. 2011, yeah. Two years. Yeah. He has, I believe, six books of poetry uh, published. He is the um, founder of the Cafe Review, right? Do I have that right? Yeah, the Cafe Review. It's good for me to do this without notes. It's like a miracle. So the Cafe Review, which um, is very well thought of and for a good reason. He's a wonderful editor. And we are really, really happy to have him here. So, uh, Steve Latrell and Latrell. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Well, my thanks to Claire and Jay for extending the invitation to share my work with you guys today. Beautiful day, and uh, good to hear Lee. And uh, so, yeah, it works out that uh, we have uh, a young lady whose work is in the new Cafe Review that I'll read of some poems from today, Pam Burr-Smith. And uh, we have in attendance our uh, art editor, Danny Loughton and his wife, and soon to be a major league uh, player, Landon. <laughs> and uh, so thank you all for coming out today. Uh, appreciate the... Uh, Opportunity, they say, as they say. Well, it's a beautiful day, and so it seems as though morning would be a good place to start. It usually is a good place to start. Morning. Morning. This morning is the first morning. Must be always, must always be the first to come to light to slow degrees. It's unclosing manifest. This morning starts here, must always start here, being where I am this morning, in the land of plenty, in the light of the sun. Past imperfect. Slow to move and indecisive, not present to himself by any measure. He drags his past like a broken leg, arriving late to his future. He's best described as vacuous and threadbare, and come to be a has-been, never having been. It's an existential poem for the times. Uh, we've, uh, on the way here, we were talking about, my wife and I were talking about the uh, the beginning of the summer and how you know June was pretty much uh, Noah's Ark time, and, uh, and so th this poem naturally comes to mind when uh, thinking about uh, how this summer started. After the storm, it kept us awake with a battering pulse, relentlessly pounding the skin of our house. It wasn't snow, but a pelting rain came, wind-borne, in the night. 
It shook the windows and toppled the trellis that stood at the back of the house. But after night, it all seemed quiet, the morning after the storm, as the dawn would come, gather us up in the light of the early morn. I know that uh, many of you in the audience write poetry, so uh, I, I think you probably share the sentiment that when you get a chance to read uh, the poem, it really kind of brings the poem to life. You know, I mean, you make it, the way I write uh, is I literally write it out and then type it and then read it. So it has a, a, a three-part history to it. But sometimes, I, th you know, if I haven't read a poem, and these, these are poems that uh, I'm reading from manuscript today uh, that will be coming out uh, next year in, in a title called Paper Boats. Spoyt and Diva will be putting out. Um, and uh, so th these are all from manuscript. But again, getting back to some of these I'm reading for the first time, and so it's, it's like, you know, you, you, you're giving them breath, literally, in the Olsonian sense of give it breath, because that's really where, it's, where the poem's coming from. Cities. Daily we see ourselves in the sad relics of our dying cities. The remnants of corporate catastrophe mark our vanity. Distance is canceled by the facticity of a riveted construction, where the failure of form is confined to a strict proportion by an artless, artless architecture. We have lost ourselves to history. No one is rescued, and the audience has gone home to the suburbs. For all you urbanites that are uh, out there. Uh, my wife and I have a, uh, a camp over here uh, on Lovejoy Pond and uh, in Wayne, and we see these things all the time. And uh, they're actually one of Christie's favorite birds. So this is called the heron. No songbird this, but a sky glider, a fish finder, a slow stride wader. The heron stands a patient bird, eyes fixed on the surface of the pond, gracefully balanced on a fallen pine, a study in determination, waiting, waiting, until his slender beak becomes a spear, and quick and perfect his thrust makes hardly a ripple, as patience gains a meal. Yeah. That was that one's for Landon, so he can uh, can envision the stabbing dart of the heron. Uh, I had a friend uh, many years ago that uh, meant a lot to me, and uh, he he too made poems, and we sometimes made poems and read them together. His name was Pat Murphy, and we used to call him Pat the Hat. And uh, so when, when he became ill and went to hospice, um, uh, shortly before he died, they, they got this box that I delivered to him. And, and, and Pat always wrote his poems on the back of menus and napkins. And someone said once, well, you know, you should print these all on napkins and serve them you know, in, in a box like that. Seemed like a good idea. So this is called The Contents of a Box for Pat. He had saved the get well cards I found packed in a box of his belongings. It seemed an odd assortment of sentiment and cheer, well-meaning in their tone, it was clear, included as the contents of the box were poems penned on napkins and faded rent receipts. He had saved against some unknown possibility. There's an irony in what might then survive us as the contents of this box would seem to prove. 
So be careful. Be careful what you leave when you leave. This is self-explanatory uh, portrait of a pair for K. She rises early, just before the dawn, waiting for the light of the early eastern sun to fill their room, begin their day. He awakes, turns over, hoping, hoping for a few extra minutes of sleep, of dream before the night might leave in shade unseen. A man, a woman, the sun and the moon. Those pairings keep the world in motion, keep them in their years as night comes in on a tide of darkness and the sun unseals the mind. Difference. Differences in diurnal approaches. Mother's Day. How is it one remembers certain folk as others lost to faded time far lost and quite forgot? What can it matter? I remember you standing on the doorstep of 1967, the sun on your face, so full of hope for the sun standing before you. Mothers must stay hopeful of their children. Somehow, it just seems natural they should. So, I didn't say fathers, I said mothers. <laughs> They're hopeful of you, young man. The mound at Fenway, keep thinking that, the mound. All right. How are we doing so far here, we all right? Yeah? This is gonna be released on Sony Records? No. <laughs> we uh, were talking with Claire earlier because she, like uh, Krista and I, uh, is a big fan of, of all things Irish. And so we were over there last October and uh, driving around, and uh, we saw a lot of these places. And uh, Krista said, uh, well, well, you know, we should buy one of those. And, yeah, especially, let's look for one with the roof still on it. <laughs> so this is called the Famine House That's funny. for my wife, Krista. <clears throat> one sees them now and then while driving through the country, a house reclaimed by nature. Roof gone, windows gone, a wild ivy climbs the chimney up, embraced with vines and thick with gorse, but with a door of strong, strong oak, still fastened to its frame on rusted hinges. It seems a ghostly welcome in its way. But those that live there left there, so I won't stop to visit there today. There are a lot of famine houses over there. This is called Daylight Savings. It was, as I remember, Sometime in mid-November that I turned back the clock. They called it daylight savings. I wanted so much to turn it back to 1965, but an hour was all I was allowed, and an hour hardly matters when one is saving time. <laughs> Keeping with the theme of all things Celtic, when we were, uh, when my wife and I were over there, not this last time, but the time before, a few years ago, we made uh, a pilgrimage, is the only word that comes to, to mind for me. Uh, we made a pilgrimage to a tower called Tor Battle that a certain poet built with his own two hands and, and uh, a lot of local help, I'm sure. Anyway, this poem is called Tor Ballalee. 
And of course, the poet was Yeats, if you don't know. We came to the tower through a thin gray rain early on a morning late in May, and a murder of crows raised a terrible screech at our coming. With square-cut blocks of ancient granite made, it keeps its secrets close, this storied tower, while slender windows catch the early sun. In the photograph, I would stand at the bridge that spanned the rushing water. In early May, in the greening time, we came upon the tower. And we were so early, they weren't even open. Uh, this, this, I, th I suppose this poem could be considered a poem of the times. Um, not everybody, I guess, but there are young people that these days meet online, if one can even wrap their mind around that. And so uh, I was uh, witness to one of these social occasions. And so this is called a lunch encounter, as opposed to a lunch counter. Although it was a lunch counter at Becky's where I encountered it. <laughs> they just met this couple at the lunch counter. They met online and found the time for lunch and conversation, which breaks in waves of a nervous rant that's never not unsure and falters on its own revealed pretensions, heavy with its purpose in trying to avoid the old faux pas. Will they, won't they meet again? Impossible to know, as I have come to witness and to go. And uh, keeping with the, the light tone of my poems, this is called The Grave Digger's Hands. One comes to know the texture of the earth, moving and removing it in turns. Hard pack and mud slush shovel full and bucket, with hands coarse and calloused like the knots and burls of an ancient tree. An ancient tree grown hoary with age and weather, grown strong with unceasing labor. The grave digger's hands hold a memory and a feeling for forgotten things and the cold gray logic of the stone. The grave digger's hands can offer no redemption, but can still and will fulfill one's final needs. This is a poem, again, of, of, of an urban nature called Tall Buildings. Although we're starting to get tall buildings in Portland now, we got a, an 18-story building going up, I know. Sad. Uh, th this particular poem was written in a city where they started putting tall buildings up after they cheated the Indians out of the whole damn island. Anyway, tall buildings. Tall buildings block the sun and shadows run the length of city sidewalks where pigeons walk in circles and people talk in earnest, each to each a pilgrim to prosperity. In the city of death and dreams, tall buildings block the sun, and sewers run below the ground unseen. I suppose as long as they're running below the ground. Jim, getting down to this. I'll depend on Yuli to let me know when it's soon. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> getting the hell off stage. I left my hook at home. All right. All right. I've got one in the car. Do you? Okay. You know, there's that old show business maxim. Always, you know, w w leave them wanting more. Always know when to get off the stage. I remember from some of the, the open readings that I hosted in the past. I wished I'd had one. <laughs> I used to get really nervous at an open reading when you see someone showing up with a packet of poems. <laughs> you know? 
And my favorite person at those open readings was the person that wanted to read first so they could read and get out of there. You know, the true poet lover, right? <laughs> An ordinary thing. It was early one morning when I saw him through the window of a small downtown cafe, a tattered city form in rags and desperation, nervous, vexed, and dirty, and in heated conversation with himself. I watched him for the length of time it took to drink my coffee, and one might say it seemed an ordinary thing. And yet, the memory lingers still. He was a perfect stranger, and I never even came to know his name. I hope this will be considered funny. You know, you don't know what people are considered funny. Really. In the age of political correctness, one has to be very careful, very careful of walking on eggshells. <laughs> I think this is all right. The family tree. Uh, with, uh, <laughs> with, with excuses to evil and war. Uh, the family tree. Every family has one, or maybe two or three familial relations hanging off that tree. The one that's never spoken of in polite society. An Uncle Bob, a crazy aunt, could never be invited to the annual reunion in the fall. One must keep up appearances in public, after all. <laughs> Do you have to get down to the... See, I tried to figure out how long I'd read, and I guess I'm reading at a quicker clip than I thought. <laughs> uh, one, of, one of my favorite poets, uh, along with a lot of other people, is uh, a gentleman by the name of William Blake. And uh, Mr. Blake perished many years ago, but at the time he was living in London, his address was called 13 Hercules, which happens to be the title of this poem, 13 Hercules. It was always there, a range of possibilities. One could reach out, take hold of, make sense somehow, make use of. It was always there, needing only to be noticed in the dance of light just beyond the margins. It's said that Blake died singing in a clear and steady voice, comfortable in knowing there is solace found in song. It is said his countenance was framed in a luminous light with the sweet angelic chorus in his ear, leaving for another promised place with an all-embracing smile on his face. Now, if you like, I'll read a, one or two more. Yes, that's, that's perfect. Yes, that's good there? Yeah. I would, no, read, no, read another one? Okay. Well, you know. That was a thumbs up. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, you know, I'm sensitive to, uh, to uh, people that, you know, uh, that guy was good, but he went on too long. <laughs> I'm not even assuming that. I mean, that's an assumption, isn't it? I think normally we read between 20 and 20. Oh, you do? Minutes, okay. So All right. You're good. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, then. Good to rock and roll. All right. All right. And I think we're at, I don't know. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's just people. Mm -hmm. Movie time. <laughs> Uh, with an epigram. Um, it's an epigram from a poet um, named Jack Gilbert. It's called Movie Time. I dream of lost vocabularies. That was Jack. There was another uh, poet, a West Coast poet named Jack Spicer that supposedly said, on his grave it said, my vocabulary did this to me. <laughs> so, so that, that, this, this poem is in keeping with that sentiment. Movie time. In the film, the actor keeps saying, give it a name, give it a name. And that for him becomes a most emphatic point. 
As name takes form and form takes movement and what's begun goes forward. I can't remember now how the movie ends or what its title was, but then again, what's in a name? And you can see the difficult process that I'm sure all of you know of trying to get 600 poems down to 150 that an impatient publisher is waiting for. Because, you know, I'm really close to a lot of these things. They're like relatives to me, some of them, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I, I, you, you get too close to the poems, and it's difficult to know, you know. Anyway. Passage. I populate myself with poems, fill myself with forms that I might overflow the boundaries of a dream. I disguise myself as an everyman in search of not so much as others might require of themselves. A witness to myself, I stand in mute reflection that I might gain a better understanding going forward. I gather myself in memory, put on a face and marvel at the passage of the years. I'd put that in your books. You would? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will. Did you bring Moby Dick? Moby Dick? No, no, I haven't put that to you. That will be in a future issue of the review. That will be the movie issue. So if any of you that write poems, and you know, I said several in the audience, have a, a favorite film that you've um, written a poem of, please send it along to the Cafe Review because we'll be putting together a, uh, an issue uh, down the road sometime. Uh, I don't generally get political, but I suppose this is a little political. Uh, another one of my favorite poets, a large six foot eight gentleman that once used to haunt the Gloucester City Council. So this is called The Government of Midnight for the memory of Charles Olson. We had been at war so long, no one could remember where or when it started, or then where it would end and another might begin. We were way past noon, and the government of midnight called the shots. It seemed the troops were sent to countries not found on any map. If, one, if ones that might be easily obtainable. This never-ending conflict with its deadly disposition was our inheritance, it seemed, while we carry our tragedies forward in the patterns of our thoughts. Well, Mr. Mr. Olson was <laughs> the poli ever the politician. We're getting down to, oh, here's one. This is uh, an untitled piece for um, a gentleman that uh, was a wonderful printer, printed great books in, in the Bay Area. Uh, his name was Dave Hazelwood, and he, he became a, a, a Buddhist, um, well-known person in the Buddhist community out there before his death. Published a lot of really great poetry, or Han Press. Untitled for Dave Hazelwood. The wind has no form and unseen makes its presence known. The mind has no form and is the center and circumference of itself. Formless be the way of wind and mind. Okay, we're getting down to it now, folks. <laughs> Your patience will be rewarded, one hopes. The hundred dollar haircut. You can see that it's not a problem with us. <laughs> He's the type of man who can't get past a clean storefront window. And not to stop and see his own reflection smiling back at him. He's the very emblem of good old spit and polish with a hundred dollar haircut to boot. He's, as they say, his very own best friend, a confident example to the end of contemporary man 
and the narcissistic trend. All right, well, we're going to close this down now uh, with, uh, I won't even try to find something appropriate because who knows what's appropriate to end. Uh, something here for sure. Well, I did have, I, I drew it now that I had brought uh, the Moby Dick poem because it's long. <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, We'll try to keep the, well, let's close with this. So uh, again, I want to thank Claire and Jay very much, and Lee very much, and all of you very much, and not necessarily in that order, for coming and helping me do this. So uh, I will close with noise, noise? No, I think I'll close with something else. This is called Relics. Relics. Old houses, new owners, and stories of the generations palpable in empty rooms. And clocks set to times that will not come again. A lifetime of accumulation left for others' care or the chore of its eventual disposal. Dust and rust seem only a patina in this place, and relics of a different time, unclaimed in disarray, crowd and clog creaking stairways in the hall, and nothing lost that wasn't found by new owners of an old house. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. Now we'll hear from Lee. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Lee, go get him. All right. Uh, let's hear once again for Steve. As the case may be. Um, all right, I'll do a couple more. Again, uh, you can find me on Instagram uh, at Man of Leisure. Um, I don't have much going on there right now, uh, but I just came back to town. So I've um, been settling in, new job, new apartment. Uh, who this? New life, who this? Um, and, and, but you can find me on Instagram. Eventually, I'll be performing more out, and uh, I'll, I'll post info there. And of course, you can always stop by the library and say hello, because I'm often here as well. So I'll do a couple more. Close out the day. Let me protect you from you.
against my tree You can have some honey too
person. Sylvia's hurrying. Sylvia's catching the nine o'clock train. Sylvia's mother says, grab your umbrella, cause Sylvia is starting to rain. Once again, Steve Luttrell, or Luttrell, and thank you, Claire and Jay, for bringing the bookie readings to us. Uh, now, back on a monthly basis, we're so happy to host them here at the Bailey Library. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Did you bring books?